Okay. Yeah, hello, everyone. Let's start the business. Um, okay. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, performance optimization. It's like mostly for the cleaners, but maybe some of you find interesting something, something interesting for that. So the performance optimization or tuning is a process of um, increasing speed, efficiency, or reliability of an application or system uh, in order to fit the needs of customers uh, um, and the users. Uh, so, so the question uh, of uh, which, which comes to the to mind first is about uh, where and why we need to improve the performance uh, and. Uh, First of all, uh, it's where is the demand for achieving uh, certain goals, pretty obvious ones. It's uh, about the user experience. So users are already get used to uh, quick and prompt uh, applications and uh, uh, immediate response. So they, of course, will be frustrated from the low performance and will go to the competitor because of that. And uh, cost reduction also uh, is a goal. Uh, and, um, Maybe your goal. It's so, for example, when you have a, a, some, some kind of platform and your application uh, is utilized with this uh, platform fully and uh, it's not enough uh, to uh, work in it so properly, you need to scale it, uh, I don't know, buy more memory cards. So, it's, uh, in order to re uh, re reduce uh, your uh, co this, this cost and save money, you can optimize the performance to fit uh, the target platform. And uh, reliability increase is also a key point of our optimization and tuning process. It's when you have a, some, some kind of memory leaks or uh, resource exhaustion, it also lowers the performance uh, and it's uh, mostly about the course of application. And uh, dealing with them also increases performance and uh, make user experience better. And uh, the second one is uh, uh, when you, um, you don't have a target device, uh, don't, don't, you don't have a hardware more powerful, so uh, but you want to improve the performance, so you need to do, deal something with that, to, to, do, to, to do something with that. Uh, okay, so uh, the question now, how to choose the performance, so what we can do. Uh, so, first of all, uh, we need to uh, identify two uh, metrics. Uh, first, it's optimization criteria. It's a vital metric. Uh, it's uh, how someone can quantify the performance uh, of your application to measure it. So, uh, and you will uh, use this metric to measure every step of your performance tuning and uh, compare them in order to see if you have some gains or not. And the second, the second one is a stopping condition. So, in order to stop at some level the optimization, you need to find a uh, uh, good enough value for you. Uh, otherwise, it will be like endless process. Um, so, uh, so some of optimization criteria are present there. Uh, it can be an execution time. It's uh, what many applications uses this metric for, for uh, a performance tuning, but uh, too much uh, regular metric to use. Or it can be a complete performance uh, when um, for applications uh, which you want mm -hmm. If you are willing to like reach or be close to computational peaks, for example, if you are speaking about or uh, or it can be a frame rate. Uh, if you are uh, dealing with uh, some gaming applications, real time uh, video applications, <coughs> so on, or memory bandwidth. If your application uh, excessively uses memory and you want to deal with that, and so on. Um, so we will talk about optimization process called top-down post-loop methodology. Uh, it's a, uh, actually a approach that simplifies users to uh, deal with the tuning process, to understand what should be done first at the right time, at the right place, uh, and uh, in a more efficient way to tune. Uh, for example, uh, here you will see um, half like three rectangles, and uh, it's a, a priority of optimization um, is that uh, should be taken into account first. For example, first we need to see at the system level tuning if you have some kind of processor bottleneck or memory bottleneck or something wrong with network, network issues. 
all these space uh, uh, issues and uh, you uh, have like a very small um, memory, physical memory. So uh, this can hide uh, uh, your application bottlenecks. And if you are uh, 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 starting with application level tuning, you will not gain much because actually any of these issues can beat it and you will, it's, it will be an efficient way of tuning. And uh, as uh, speaking of application level tuning, it's uh, about dealing with uh, uh, mass threading issues uh, and uh, uh, synchronization issues when it, uh, loading imbalance, uh, also uh, APIs used, are they efficient or not, and so on. And uh, the uh, latest step is when you are thinking that my application is yeah, well enough, it's well optimized, I can use it, uh, and but I think, but it still uh, doesn't meet the criteria, the, uh, not the, yeah, the stopping condition. So for that particular purpose, you can run a map level tuning and to see what's going on with the uh, central processor uh, architecture. Yeah? Uh, do we have some uh, inefficiencies in instruction use, uh, execution unit use, or there is uh, some um, uh, branch mispredictions, or yeah, or maybe it's cache misses, you are using external member and so on. Uh, so, yes. And uh, one more uh, one thing, the second part of uh, this particular methodology, and it's about the closed loop part. Uh, it's uh, uh, here is a closed loop. Uh, it's uh, actually an iterative process of um, tuning. Uh, so uh, you uh, uh, to reach a particular stopping uh, condition, you need to repeat after each iteration. And uh, in each iteration, you should uh, particular concentrate on one thing or uh, one performance issue. It's an efficient way uh, comparing to spreading between several issues. Oh, I have this problem, this problem, and then fix it. And you uh, can gain or cannot gain and don't understand the actual uh, reason or what's actual bottom up. Uh, uh, so first, we need to uh, uh, or suppose you have an application. You, uh, Define a baseline. Uh, we will take about, uh, talk about this uh, later. Um, to, uh, what, is the, what is a solid baseline? Uh, but you need to define the baseline of your application, uh, and this should be a true application, not like some artificial, uh, artificially low rate application with low performance, or uh, otherwise like a, a very high optimized application because you will not uh, gain much and will not be truly. Uh, kind of optimize the process for registration. Uh, uh, so it should be a real application with a real condition, uh, not like a stress test. Uh, then you, uh, after defining the baseline, you are gathering per per performance data using uh, better to use profiles, of course, because it uh, helps you to do it quickly, the manually. Then you are starting analyzing process uh, and identifying the issues, the main domain bottlenecks of, of this particular uh, data you offer, and then uh, you are using you can use advices from uh, performance tools. Uh, mostly, performance tools shows you uh, show you the particular uh, bottleneck by how, uh, highlighting the issue using red flags or some uh, analysis tools, and you can see and uh, then uh, uh, apply this particular uh, advice and to your application. And uh, test again to see, uh, do you uh, reach the stop condition? Do, do you have an uh, improvement uh, in the performance gain from that? And if a uh, uh, stop condition is met, then we are okay. If not, we repeat the process. So, um, and the key points to navigate through the closed loop. Yes, it's use the right workload, build a solid baseline, and uh, measure in such a way that uh, data of interest is minimally affected. But that means, like, if you're using a profiler, you know, uh, maybe some kind of uh, self written profiler that uh, measures your performance and introduces a big overhead, then you cannot understand the actual real uh, performance of your application from that. So you need to uh, use the uh, you know, right way to measure performance. So uh, then you need to first put to unexpected results. Uh, because it's uh, mostly hint for the design level um, optimization and your design to your system are not very well and you just missed something, I don't know, maybe there are some issues with that. Um, 
the, then you focus on one issue at a time, as we're talking. Uh, then uh, you can uh, see several alternatives how to fix uh, a particular problem. Uh, for example, for example, if you, you know, have a memory issue and you are using an external memory uh, because of a biggest workload, you can use uh, cache styling techniques to deal with it or other things. And you can you, you should uh, see on this and verify uh, which one is the most simplest one and uh, it gave you like a good performance. Um, and yes, yeah, so on the revised result, make your expectations. And also the correctness is not broken after optimization. Okay, so and uh, about the baseline, going back to the baseline, uh, how to build a solid baseline, uh, you need to use, a, you can use a, 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 a two like compiler flux, so uh, use the risk mode, the obvious thing, to improve the optimization, and uh, yeah, or two or, or three flux uh, or good uh, optimizations for your uh, particular application. Uh, then uh, you can uh, compile a target-dependent code. For example, you are knowing you are using a machine which utilizes a highest uh, instruction set architecture like uh, AVX so or Hardware 12. Then you can uh, uh, provide the particular compiler options in order to utilize it. And you will gain from that because you will use a wider vector registers. And of course, use optimized libraries, uh, which uh, have been written specifically with optimization, uh, like uh, or MK, MKL, or OpenMP, or Tazen Data Blocks, or uh, um, APL, and so on, depending on your need. So, um, yeah, and uh, also one uh, important and vital thing is uh, how to make a right workflow. So, uh, in order to have an accurate performance tuning uh, process, you need to, uh, your code to be measurable. Uh, but that means you can measure the performance and this performance, uh, and uh, this measure metric is stable. So from round to round, they aren't, so, uh, they aren't very much. Uh, if they are very much, then it's uh, difficult to understand the actual uh, performance on the application. And the average uh, performance is not an option here, because it's uh, like uh, Europe. Uh, also, it should be reproducible. There are so particular uh, points um, intercepting each other, actually. Yes. Uh, reproducible also means yeah, that you can uh, run it and uh, get uh, the same result. Uh, static, uh, it's also about that uh, the results are not uh, varied too much. Uh, and um, for example, if you have an uh, application, um, I don't know, a random, uh, which has a random input. And uh, it uh, uses uh, input output and writing into a file. And uh, it's uh, from uh, one point, it utilizes a file system more than 75%. Then a uh, lot of the storage operations will be lower it, and you will have low performance with it. And another, case, another run will not utilize such much uh, disk space consumption, so you will have another performance there. Okay. Um, okay, and uh, about the performance optimization levels we have uh, from the point uh, uh, from point of code. So first of all, it's, uh, uh, when you uh, when I'm speaking about the performance, uh, when you're designing your application, you need to, uh, also to take to take into account to keep in mind uh, the optimization. Uh, but that means um, uh, if you have a goal to, if you know that your application will utilize a lot of memory or a lot of uh, disk space, then you need to design in such a way that uh, it will not have such particular as a bottleneck. Um, the second step is algorithms and data structures. It's a pretty uh, fair known thing about optimization, most interviewed question. So you need to try to uh, Write uh, the older algorithm such a way that it will uh, lose, lose a smaller complexity. Uh, so uh, if you if you can use an algorithm that uh, or big or of logarithm n, it's better than use uh, the big O of n and so on. And uh, this particular two points uh, there can increase performance uh, in a bigger way, uh, and it might be huge, uh, and, uh, and you can gain from it much. 
And if you have already a file, uh, um, good enough applications from this point of view, you can uh, go deeper, uh, to the source code at the compiler's level. Uh, it um, will uh, increase performance in its way, uh, but still you can uh, learn from that. And by this means, like some optimization techniques uh, from the source code, like combining, uh, uh, loop function optimization, like loop fusion, loop unrolling, um, also cache styling technique can be here, and so on. And also it includes uh, vectorization uh, using vector units of a particular CPU, and the polarization is um, about multi-threading, so you can use several CPUs if you have it. Okay. So, yeah, let's uh, look at the application of the day, so, which we will profile today, and see how can we uh, optimize it. So we will uh, take a look at uh, uh, onboarding uh, gravity simulation. Uh, it's a simple application. It's um, kind of uh, pretty much, uh, HP, I can say, HPC application. Uh, so let's consider a distribution of point masses located at uh, R1 to Rn, and uh, they have masses from M1 to Mn. So we'll calculate the positions of particles after the same time interval. New law, Newton law. And here, uh, what is placed here is actually a core logic of this particular uh, example sample. Yeah, so it's a struct particle uh, which we are using. And here, like two, uh, you can see this uh, four uh, red lines that are highlighting four loops that we have. And uh, first, uh, uh, and you have, can see the comment update acceleration is a uh, First part of our core logic of this particular uh, application, which is uh, actually about acceleration update, uh, uh, was using some math and computation there. And the second part is uh, uh, position and velocity update after uh, acceleration is calculated. Um, so we will um, later take a look at this particular uh, source code and try to optimize it. Um, Sorry. We need more ventilation, I think. There are a lot of people in the room. and uh, Can you open one of the main uh, doors if possible? Organizers, if possible. There's a lot of feet inside. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> about uh, this particular um, sample. So, what is the workload here? Uh, the right report is our core logic. Uh, then, performance criteria will be like a regular one, execution time here. Stopping condition will be like strict one, and uh, it's a little bit uh, three seconds here. And baseline is uh, uh, 17 minutes. Uh, and uh, the the platform that we will use uh, for running at the client is um, so Intel server platform, Xeon Platinum, with uh, two sockets and uh, uh, 48 uh, nickel cores. Um, and uh, the, this particular application we will compile using Intel or one API because it was compiled. So let's get tuning. So we'll try to make it fast with most pleasant. Here. So, uh, first step that should be taken into account is uh, as we're speaking about it. Uh, uh, one second, I need to make a point that let's suggest that system level optimization is already done. So, and we are uh, fine with that. So, let's take a look at the particular uh, application level optimization. So, uh, first of all, we want to understand is our algorithmic and uh, uh, design optimization uh, is our algorithmic and design choices good enough, uh, and we want to uh, run top loss cost analysis uh, or we'll profile for that. We should focus as uh, we've spoken on inspected host costs to understand if something gets wrong. And uh, then also the good key point here that we need to focus on large host costs, the uh, heaviest uh, uh, host costs, and spend a lot of the time of the application. Uh, because it doesn't make sense to optimize the smallest one. If you also, if actually if you're winning so, and you because I think it's easier, it still will not help because it's a small, small improvement. Better to start with a large one and understand how to optimize them. 
Um, so it's a, a top hotspots analysis report from Ethereum for our uh, particular sample with an embodied simulation. And actually, uh, uh, there is no uh, unexpected hotspot found. So we are good with our current implementation from design of algorithmic choices. Uh, here you can see that the gravity simulation run is a top hotspot, uh, like uh, it's taking 879 uh, seconds. And uh, this is uh, the function in which our core logic is located. So you can see here it's on 70s uh, source line, there is, sorry, if maybe too small. <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, I can say this, it's, there is written uh, the gravity simulation run function. And here uh, below is located our core logic that we are going to optimize our workload. So the next step then is to run the performance snapshot that will help you to see the quick view of uh, other performance of other areas of uh, uh, possible bottlenecks. It shows some information about physical or uh, logical physical core usage, uh, about uh, vectorization. Uh, about migrated architecture usage. So you can see uh, which, uh, it's a quick cue to see which area you should uh, try and uh, should try first or second and so on. And we can see actually that, uh, first of all, we can see to the core utilization and we can see that effective utilization is less than, not less, than, just uh, exactly a one percentage. And yeah, that's true because our application is a zero code. It's not optimal. It's not multi-threaded yet. So let's. Uh, but as you remember, we have a four, uh, forty-eight physical cores and uh, ninety-six uh, logical cores. We can gain from them actually much. So let's try to apply some uh, uh, multi-threading approaches there. Uh, so uh, I have chosen an uh, open MP threading because it's uh, less intrusive to the code and uh, you can just write fragments to uh, already um, existing loops and uh, gain from that. Uh, but you can try different threading design options using a uh, threading feature of advisor. It uh, can help you to prototype different threading models and uh, the workload combination, which, uh, for example, which particular number of uh, CPUs you need for your workload, uh, and so on. So here we have our uh, first part of uh, core logic uh, acceleration update, which we are parallel uh, using Pragma and parallel flow. And the next uh, part, the second part, is also is spread using Pragma and before. And we here using reduction for the energy uh, variable because it's um, uh, actually an addition from uh, from uh, each, each iteration. So it cannot be parallelized well, but using OpenMP, it can do uh, efficient reduction of, uh, by um, summing it in the end, and it's all calculate each energy to each iteration uh, to put uh, in the buffer, and then it, in the matter end, it will um, sum them efficiently. And we don't need to do something with our own. So, okay. After that, we need to rerun our analysis and see uh, uh, how we get from that. Uh, so our baseline was uh, uh, 70 minutes, and after mass trading, we have 19 seconds. So pretty much good one. Yes, yeah, so of course, because we have good uh, hardware here, like uh, with uh, 96 uh, logical cores, and we can see that the result of our uh, of our, our analysis shows us that. Effective uh, CPU utilization now in 93 percentage compared to one percent of the had previously. And the below is a um, um, view of uh, our um, uh, uh, logical threads, and you can see that all of them are uh, fine, uh, fulfilled with uh, work. So, uh, but yeah, we still not um, meet our stopping uh, condition. Uh, so we need to do one more iteration. So let's get that. Um, get uh, the performance snapshot again to see which areas we can improve. And uh, you can see that now the logical core utilization is not uh, red stuff. So it's okay for us because we are using and utilizing it for that. 
but you can go to the vectorization part and see that uh, we uh, have actually after the terrace code, the compiler uh, tried and did what he, he can did he can do uh, for us, but uh, it's uh, not efficient. Uh, you can see here we're only uh, utilizing 23 percentage of the packet or packet or uh, vectorized floating point operations. It, it, there can be different reasons for that. Uh, so, for example, uh, you are using some um, some particular things that uh, damage your vectorization. It's, you are not using the right uh, data types, or uh, you are not um, using uh, good memory access part, and so on. Um, okay, let's uh, yes. Oh, it's also about the instruction set. If you're utilizing the lower one, you will have a less uh, uh, performance. So, what is a vectorization? If somebody is not familiar with it, uh, we can speak about it. So, uh, it's a um, process of transforming your program uh, from working with a, a one, uh, a, a single layer to, uh, at a time for instruction, to uh, a vector or array of values at a time for instruction. So, so uh, I can say, like, uh, in a regular way, our instruction will take an appearance as a single value. But the vector instruction, uh, she, uh, it works with uh, uh, vector registers who can take uh, arrays of elements and also and it uh, can uh, sum or add or divide uh, this, uh, this particular data uh, at one instruction at a time. For example, uh, instead of that, when we, have, uh, when we are summing two values, we will sum uh, up to eight values. Uh, and here we have an example for that. For example, uh, here we will go through 16 iterations, and here we will go through uh, two iterations actually, because we first edition will um, sum eight elements, and the next addition will sum other eight elements. And we, instead of taking 16 iterations, we will take only two directions. And also we can do it like of uh, iterating, uh, which will less iterate, and also uh, perform optimization. Uh, so, uh, which particular vector types we have uh, in, um, Intel uh, Sandro, uh, CPUs have? Uh, there default, uh, there are all those ones uh, Intel uh, SSD uh, ISA, structure set architecture, which uh, can work with uh, single precision floating points and uh, can work at a single, a single session to work with up to four uh, floating point uh, elements. And about um, uh, SSE2 uh, uh, instruction set architecture, it can work also with it's, it's a 128 byte wide vector register. It's, it's also 128 byte, but it can work not only with single precision but with double precision and integer operations, different types. Uh, so, and uh, I need to say that um, where you are compiling. Uh, uh, especially when you need to compile with default options without using some target dependent options, it will generate instructions uh, with this particular um, instruction sets. It will not uh, gain from uh, the freshest one, the highest one. So, we have a second uh, type of uh, highest uh, vector um, uh, instruction set as. Uh, uh, instructions of architectures. It, uh, uh, it's called Intel AVX. It, uh, it's a, a wider um, you know, re vector register and it can take up to 256 bit, bits. And uh, AVX works with single precisions and double precisions with forwards. And AVX2 can work with intervals too and bits. And uh, the highest and widest one is uh, AVX 512. It can work uh, with a wide register up to 512 bits, uh, and uh, also it can work with uh, all the types, uh, all the primitive types here. Um, okay, so one more slide about vectorization, <coughs> and about we will see here an uh, how about artificial assembly for the particular, for example, for regular code without vectorization, 
assembly for that particular scalar loop, we can say, will be like, we are loading one element to the one uh, regular register, as the array, and we are loading uh, from the memory another element from another array to um, register and RB, then we are using regular add instruction, uh, and uh, the result is stored in the RC, and we are using memory instruction to so store from the register to the uh, memory back to uh, SA array, and then we are um, adding, using interaction uh, in, in increment uh, 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 instruction, uh, implementing our uh, counter. And assembly for authorized loop will uh, use uh, another type of instructions called factor or authorized instructions. It will load uh, not one, uh, one element, but uh, four, uh, four elements, and it will load not to the regular register, to the vector register. Uh, and the same for this will be done for both for buffers. Then we will uh, call um, uh, vectorize it, uh, add instruction, or factor in the instruction, because it can work not with only, uh, not with single elements, but with buffers. And then we will call fact store instruction, that can store a, a buffer to or back to the array. Then we will increment our um, counters not by one element, but by the four, because we're already processing four elements. And uh, you can uh, gain much from uh, both uh, mm -hmm. performance techniques from auto-threading and vectorization. It's like, it's in ideal world, it's like a multiplication of uh, speed up from multi-threading uh, to speed up of vectorization. But in real world, we are uh, uh, bound to managing resources, uh, some synchronization primitives we are using on communications. Uh, and so some uh, runtime overhead for four threads and so on. But uh, how it works actually, you have uh, several CPUs and each CPU has its own vector unit and uses its own vector register. So, so you first utilize CPUs uh, with multi threading and then each CPU utilizes vectorization. And it's how we are uh, getting from that much. So um, now we'll get back to the analysis, enough theory. So uh, we are using here vectorization analysis. This can show us uh, what uh, defeats vectorization or why our vectorization is uh, inefficient. And here, uh, Profiler has recommendations for us like uh, that can help us to understand what's going on. And uh, here we can see that uh, the headers, our headers loop, actually our core basic logic part, uh, contains uh, data type conversions. Uh, and uh, because of that, we uh, it, it, it's, we don't have a, um, like a efficient vectorization that can gain from that fully, uh, because uh, we cannot put to the vector, to the vector register the smallest type. We are putting the, the type to which we can work on. So, and the recommendation here is try to fit uh, the smallest uh, try to use the smallest type that fits the needs and uh, use the. Uh, uh, entire vector register. So we'll go back to the pot. And uh, what we are doing here, actually, we can see that our report uh, is written not uh, good enough in this particular case. Uh, we are having we are we're having constants that are uh, were double instead of flow, but actually we are working with particles uh, structure which uh, has um, a floating point type of uh, all the data, acceleration, uh, mass, uh, or velocity, positions, and so on. So uh, we are fixing all the places we here. We see there are the types, and also here you can see that for distance inf uh, variable, here we have a, a constant without literal. It's also well, the double, and uh, after uh, type of um, conversion group, our distance of inf to double, and we are putting here also f literal in order to uh, make them uh, flow. So after that, let's uh, rerun uh, performance uh, analysis again and see how can we can get to that. So after um, our first utilization of room, we can see that uh, we have uh, 10 seconds for uh, our application run, and the previous run was 19 seconds, and the baseline is 17 years. So we kind of improve our application a lot. And you can see that now our analysis show that uh, localization is used 100%. And uh, you can see that um, 
Actually, uh, here uh, we are, so, yeah, but we are using pet instructions at uh, 128B, so the uh, smallest one. And uh, also, that instruction set points us to SSE2 SSE. Uh, uh, let's uh, see. To, uh, let's think about this and see what we can do with that. So uh, we are running our analysis. Uh, and yes, one more time. Sorry, I told this product on the slide. So uh, one more time, we are, can see we are both see utilization analysis report. See, and we can see that there is a recommendation that actually on our machine. Uh, there are highest uh, uh, instructions set available. Uh, it's uh, AV so 112. And in order to utilize this, we need to provide a, a target dependent option, one of the pro <laughs> suggested ones. So, uh, okay, let's do this. Update our make file with an option and repeat the analysis. And we can see that we still, uh, so, yeah, we uh, again have a performance improvement there. Uh, previously it was 10 seconds, not now, uh, now it's 4 seconds, about 8, uh, compared to the baseline 70 minutes. Uh, and we can see now that the utilization report shows that we are using 512 bit of packet instructions uh, or utilization instructions. And also, the vector instruction set from the vectorization analysis shows us that we are using every 512 instruction set architect. So, yeah. Uh, so, but right, we still are um, not meeting our stopping condition, mm -hmm. which is uh, three seconds. Uh, but yeah, we're close enough. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, take one more iteration here. Uh, okay, so now we can think that our application is well enough optimized in terms of application level. And uh, we can think about microarchitecture level optimizations here and uh, try to explore a matter architecture of a central processor unit. Uh, so a little bit about uh, microarchitecture here. We, uh, our central processor has uh, two uh, halves, the main halves, it's a front end and back end. Front end uh, is, uh, for, is responsible for um, fetching and decoding uh, an architectural instruction into the micro operation. And uh, then uh, it puts it to derives it to a cage station and backend uh, it, uh, retrieves it and uh, uh, executes it while monitoring that uh, information for that particular macro operation is available, like appearance and so on. And uh, all both uh, both uh, both halves can work with uh, up to four micro -oper uh, micro operations. And uh, from that uh, perspective, there is like a, an abstraction um, definition of uh, pipeline slot or allocation slot, which can work with one uh, micro operation at cycle, at a cycle or at a clock. And uh, here, uh, in the, the modern processor, as I said, we can work, we can work with the four uh, allocation slots available. So um, at the time. So, uh, an uh, ideal um, uh, CPU pipeline uh, will be uh, with four, uh, allocation, uh, four allocation slots available, and we can gain from that. But the yeah, realistic uh, situation is that uh, some of them are idle because of different uh, reasons, or it's either front end bound or back end bound reason, reasons, or, and it, or the front end is uh, unable to deliver their. Uh, micro operation as a, at the time when it's front end bound, uh, or the client cannot uh, work with such particular uh, micro operation because, for example, he is waiting for you know load buffers and so on, and it uh, back end bound. And also, there can be best calculations about uh, range predictions. So uh, we can, um, and yeah, a little bit about uh, I forgot to mention CPI. It's a uh, uh, clock instruction, and the ideal is. Uh, or all the uh, 25 so we have, can have four iterations per clock or per cycle. So let's take a look at our uh, microarchitecture um, of uh, CPU. C you can see here that uh, our CPI rate uh, is uh, 108, and uh, our port is mostly backhand bound. 
And back and bound here is uh, divided into two categories. It's a uh, memory bound and core bound. And uh, it's we, in uh, total, we have like 47 uh, percentage of uh, uh, memory bound, or oh, sorry, back and bound code. And uh, we can take a look of, uh, for example, first start with the memory bound code and see uh, what is going on here. And the uh, memory bound is, uh, mostly caused by some latencies which can uh, uh, which, um, delay the instructions to retire, to complete. Yeah, and the green one is retiring. Retiring is a, a when the micro-op is actually completed and uh, um, so information from, uh, from the registers going back to the memory, everything is done, it's a, a very good state. And others is like, uh, what you should uh, pay attention. Okay, let's uh, take a look at the memory bound because we have a, 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 a percentage here. So um, here I'm using a memory access analysis uh, and I drill down to ourselves to see uh, what is going on here. And uh, um, you can see that for particular uh, lines here, the source code, it's our actually core part. Yes, yeah, still first iteration, acceleration update. There are memory bound. Uh, there are flags in the memory bound. I just highlighted them with the rectangles. Uh, there are already a red flag. And uh, actually, uh, you can see that here by using a uh, so-called um, arrays which contain structures. So our memory access pattern uh, is. Uh, not good because we are uh, dumping from one element from position X to the next element of position X through the, all the structure of the size structure. Because structure has not only post X but other uh, data members. And uh, in memory, yeah, we'll have another slide for that. Uh, it's located in, uh, it has gaps you know, like when loading these particular structures. Uh, okay. It's a. Uh, um, other memory analysis which we have it's an, from the advisor side, it's uh, all, uh, after, the, after it's run, we have new recommendations provided to us, and it's yeah, it's, a, a, it's differently said that we have an efficient memory access partner, uh, it's a regular one, and um, it's very uh, installed to improve the performance. We need improve the performance and vectorization because vectorization is good when all the data are close to each other. We need to uh, deal somehow with this particular issue. So, uh, a little bit about memory access patterns. So, uh, we have uh, in theory and actually in our code. So, uh, the, um, okay, the good one and the best one is the unistride access. When you, um, uh, when all the elements are subsequential uh, and you can go with the uh, unit step to the next element and but they are uh, best to fit to the caches to the vector registers and so on constant side access and where you actually uh, go to the next element uh, from uh, a gap so you have the first element the second element is like a three element or more and it's actually uh, our, our, in our case because we have a structure and uh, a structure has not only one element but for example, here the structure has four elements, and the next uh, first element is uh, three uh, elements far away from the previous iteration. And the variable side access is like a random access when you, uh, I don't know, have for some another um, array that uh, is indexing array, and the, it's unpredictable which particular um, place of the next iteration we, we should take. So it's the worst uh, for vectorization and uh, caching and so on. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, seemed. Uh, so, oh yeah, I have forgotten to mention what does it mean? Seemed is seemed on such multiple data. It's about vectorization actually. Uh, so vectorization or SIMD is effective when we are using unistat access as we've spoken. So. Instead of getting uh, array of structures, which we have now, uh, 
yeah, it also can load into the vector register in the study for store operation required multiple wall shuffle and sort of graph instructions. So actually, uh, processor compound can uh, deal with it. We don't need to do something. We also have vectorized, but, but it will be inefficiently vectorized. But uh, if we are changing uh, from the array of structures to structure of arrays, then we have like structure and each elements in um, all elements uh, will be an array, uh, so it's all the uh, contiguous uh, memory. So we will uh, gain from the vectorization more simple, simple is compatible with most other accesses. Okay, um, then let's rewrite our code. So uh, you can use as a manual rewriting, it's actually, uh, I, I have used this one, this particular presentation. But also we have an Intel SDL, SDLT library, uh, some data layout templates library that can help you to uh, make less introduce changes to the code to change from uh, an array um, of structures to the structure of arrays. Uh, so, but here we are uh, just rewriting code just for the sake of more understanding. So here you can see that. Uh, the changes are so particles like a sim single structure now, it's not a vector of structures, it's a single structure, and it contains vectors for each participle data member for the position, for the velocity, uh, for acceleration, and the mass. And here, all the uh, accesses are, are now unit stranded. Okay, see how we gain from that. So, uh, yeah, we already uh, we, we finally met our stopping condition. We have uh, one uh, the five seconds uh, of our, our the execution time of our uh, application with all the changes done. Uh, and uh, it's yeah, like uh, 689 uh, uh, times improvement from our baseline. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, how now uh, our, our microarchitecture is looking like. And you can see that below is uh, uh, like a table with array characteristic about what should, what is which particular uh, percentage is good for each category. And yeah, uh, for our part is HPC application because it's more like HPC with uh, extensive computer operations. And uh, for retirement we met. Uh, the average good value for backhand bound, uh, backhand bound, it's memory, mm, it's uh, a little bit under, uh, and uh, for front end bound, yeah, we, we're also under, uh, so not uh, over uh, the metric. It's, uh, it's uh, back, but not much because we already met our stopping stop condition. So, um, yes, of course, you can go deeper. You can. You see that all we don't uh, met, uh, we didn't meet all the uh, kind of here, yeah, the, all, all the percentages for the good value of our application. But uh, um, uh, yes, uh, but actually we met the criterion, which is our goal. You can and what we can do for digging deeper actually is uh, as I write some parts into the assembly, but uh, you will be left behind if your new hardware is released. And actually, it's like um, if you are devastated. So, so yeah, the best approach is to measure the CPI, whatever you do, in order to uh, understand what's going on with such a particular fine grand tuning. And also, it's like the modern one for now, you can uh, consider floating code to some accelerators like GPU, FPGA, and so on. And uh, here you have a screenshot of um, running a fault modeling feature of an advisor which runs a modeling to the point of uh, your know, discrete card of Intel, uh, how it can gain if we uh, afford this particular top cost code of our workload to, to the GPU. And actually it says to us that it should be like uh, 539 uh, milliseconds instead of uh, one of the three seconds. But uh, yeah, so now we also need to take into account that there should be some part of uh, CPU uh, preparing code for GPU, and uh, it's also uh, for the link also shows this information. And also, you can do then uh, using the profiles, you also can optimize uh, G uh, GPU code uh, if you have some uh, buttons there. Okay, 
our optimization results. Just uh, if somebody uh, is hurt or you forgot them. Um, so we have optimized from you know, 70 minutes to 105 seconds, pretty good for us. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, let's stick to the key points of, and it's like a summary for our presentation for today. Um, first, what uh, should be kept in mind, let's say, uh, please use optimized library whenever it's possible, not write your, your, this code by your own because people already optimize it for you. Uh, get a solid baseline, the real world application that you use uh, uh, regular conditions of the system and so on. Uh, define optimization criterion for your workload. Uh, so also, uh, it should be a, a considerable choice because depending on what you want to optimize. So file record, use compilers. Uh, first, fix your design and algorithmic issues uh, in order to gain much. Uh, vectorize and parallelize, and uh, uh, to have the compiler with the options rather to go well to the subject. Uh, yeah, that's it. And so, just for links. Showed how, how this works with the Intel V2 compiler. How much of this can you do with the? Uh, I, mean, I, I don't need to mention names, but <laughs> pick the the most used C++ IDE out there by I don't know, company starting with them. <laughs> how, how much how much can you achieve? Can you can you do everything, or can you do something? What can you do? What can you not do? Thanks. You mean if I'm using their compiler or their profile because they have both? Yeah, it's uh, made my mean, question better. Uh, I think uh, actually for the sake of optimizing uh, the sample or application that is written using their compiler, better to use their profile for the purpose because it's tuned to and has uh, good advices for that. And they also have uh, the profile for the purpose, but you can use uh, all these tools too, because they can provide uh, useful information. Uh, they uh, will not provide uh, some vectorization advices because they are tied to Intel compiler because it um, uh, uh, it provides some vectorization uh, report information to uh, the, uh, bound to, to binary and it's in a binary which uh, is not available from the, uh, other compilers. But as uh, some um, insert, some insights will take, of course. And, you can go with Um, colleagues, I want to add something that the first line is that Intel VPC++, you can install it with a studio and change your compiler and fully utilize the Intel compiler, where you get all these benefits for free. And my question to you would be where people can get this compiler and where the people can get all the libraries that you mentioned for STD, PPD, and all the rest. All uh, right. Okay. It's uh, you can uh, now it's modern to download uh, one API toolkits. There is a base, base toolkit that uh, is available publicly and uh, free for use. Like and there is all these uh, um, tools. Uh, it contains also a compiler and tools. In the same. Uh, so you can just download that. Um, yeah. Sorry, I haven't put that in it's the link here. Yeah, but I can update it and uh, send the presentation. I would say that this is less of a C++ uh, optimization. It is more using efficiently the hardware. So you have to know your hardware. Because basically what presented here, you are doing some optimizations knowing the hardware architecture of your uh, CPU. And if you migrate to another CPU, this stuff will not work. Probably work, probably it won't work. But most likely it's not going to work. So if you, as an application developer, if you write directly software using all these uh, optimizations, you are going to write uh, software which is not relocatable to other um, architectures. And actually I faced this kind of issue once to one of our uh, suppliers, and I said, hey guys, uh, give me the software and I will put it on a different system. And they could not 
give me the, the software because all the optimizations that they done were for that particular ARM uh, architecture. They could not migrate to a different ARM uh, architecture later on. So this is relevant for the framework designers with uh, developing the libraries. Okay, I developed a different library, uh, which if I know the other architecture, I'm using this uh, different yeah. mix. Yeah. And later on, for smart architecture and the application layer, I can decide, hey, if I'm here, I'm using this mm -hmm. in the library. If I'm on an ARM architecture, probably I'm going to do something from elsewhere, and so on. Yeah. So I would say that it's not really correct to say C++ optimization, rather architecture-based optimization. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. When I work, yeah, I'm not speaking about yeah. It's like an example of C++, and you actually uh, optimize not only C++ application for trans, trans, and other. No, yeah, it's not. Uh, I'm speaking from an uh, engineering manager perspective. Yeah. I'm just making this slide. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry, but an info compiler, we do check for UID, so if you compile it for Intel, the other compilers will check for the people, and they'll be back with the No, this, this stuff will not run on an app. Here. Yeah. It depends. If you have an open API, if you have a predefined library, which includes all the architecture, it will run. You can write that actually, yes, because you will select that on that. Yeah. yeah. Next I was wondering about the stopping time for you. So you have 1,000 seconds and you look at the code, and if you can guess that it will take less than three seconds, how can you come up with that? I think it's perfect. I mean, um, yeah, it's a good question, actually. Um, most of them, I think, should be. As you're directed by your, I don't know, you uh, can have a task like this. So we have such hardware, and you want this particular application run for faster, for example, and you have a mm -hmm. like, deadline criteria, like it should be such seconds. And then you will think about how to optimize. You shouldn't like, okay, or you can start from something, but at least I will uh, decrease it twice. So it's, yeah, it's not, it's not like a methodology for that, but it's, at least I don't know the methodology. I will use like, is it, is it like your suggestions from the first like on a pessimistic one, or is it a, a kind of what's called? Yeah, it's a, it's a task from somebody that told already uh, wants you to optimize performance because he needs it for his particular purposes. Um. <clears throat> How did you pick the order of your optimizations? And, and does the tool guide you? Did it say, like, do yeah. multi threading first and then do vectorization? Um, yeah, most of them, um, speaking of that, yes, you can see that, uh, um, okay, from uh, from the sake of vectorization and multi threading, there is no like uh, actual. Uh, Guidance what you should do first. I mean, in terms of uh, profilers, but uh, uh, as for other things, like most of them have a, uh, in the terms of advice, have a recommendation with a high uh, confidence. They're showing you it's a first priority recommendation with a high confidence, and please apply this first. It should be much more gain from that than the next one. So, profile must be doing for that for you, the guiding. Yeah. Um. One question. You mentioned uh, GPU optimizations um, on your last slide. Um, is it specific to the Intel architecture? Or what GPU did you use? Or do you have tools that especially also are made for GPU optimizations? Um, yeah, it's uh, specifically yeah, for Intel uh, GPU architecture. Yeah, because, uh, there are no information about configurations and so on. But as far as I know, actually. Yes, for now. And so from all the ones you showed, the vectorization is the one that seems like more black magic to me. Is there a way to ensure that this is used, or can you give some tips on how to change your code so that vectorization is used um, in your portal or your data access? Uh, you mean how to understand that it's required? Or? Um, how, to, how to change your code that is not using vectorization uh, to yeah, the compiler. Uh, firstly, yes. yeah. Firstly, compiler will try to do the best. So he will try to yeah, uh, vectorize, maybe not uh, uh, in an efficient way with 
not possible, but it tries to do the best with efficient way. But, uh, but, but then you can run uh, for vectorization circuit, uh, you can use uh, an advisor which has a vectorization report with all the information about the efficiency. And what you can do, it shows the recommendations and it shows uh, if, uh, if uh, it's some, something is wrong with uh, um, memory access, yes, with the data correctness. For example, you have data dependencies between iterations in the loop. For example, the next iteration is dependent on the previous iteration. Uh, you also have this information available that you cannot parallelize this code about that. And so on. And it shows you the recommendation you can stick to them and try to use what they are suggesting to. So most of them they suggest, for example, using the SDLT library, they also suggest you to do that. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, really good. Uh, I have a comment and a question. A comment about applicability for like a different platforms. I think the general advice approach and all this are applicable for kind of any language and maybe speaking any platform. Yes, so it's not really that uh, like the couple with the into architecture plus authorization is available on the middle and also memory access and uh, advice on algorithmic complexity that's all on the University. Yes, so this, uh, this one uh, comment about this, but the question is: so so far there was um, so there was the, the framing was added using open and the question is if I have an application ready, for example, legacy where there are some threads, how can I analyze using this tooling kind of efficiency of the threading model? So what can the tooling offer in this case? So just in general. So you have a trading feature and writer that can show you. It can help you prototype actually what trading model can be used in an efficient way here or more efficiently. And also you have a trading analysis on each one that can help you understand how efficient your are and what you can be done. Is a question about that or but if for example I have some shared data yes and, oh. and that most of the time is actually spent in some synchronization primitives. So will I see that uh, somehow? Mm -hmm. In the, in the yeah, the guys need to tick with that. <laughs> yes, you'll see that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, and I'm taking the Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question that comes on the compiler. So, if I understood correctly, it was compiled with the uh, Intel compiler. Do I get the same depth of information if I use GCC or Knight, on which I think now the Intel compiler is based? Or do I really need to rely on the Intel compiler to get the full extent of the information? Uh, you can use a GCC compiler or uh, MSCC compiler or any of them. You will have uh, useful information. As uh, yes, it said, or some of the optimizations are pretty common for that, and they will be shown or also about the memory cells, about the data correctness, and so on. They are not tied to the compiler. But uh, yes, some vectorization uh, advices will not work. With it. Uh, um, GCC has a vectorization, of course, and if you will also gain from that. But not all the advices uh, are kind of that we have for Intel, we will show for this because we don't know how to show it. So, yeah, we'll show you, uh, you will have an, a few insightful information, but not much uh, rich of, of, uh, as for Intel. Okay, thank you. Follow up on that. Uh, have you ever used VTune with a remote SSH access on VM on which you don't have control, like from big provider? And can you get also the same extent of information? So, spoiler, I tried some month ago and I didn't manage to get all these kind of nice goodies. So, I just wonder if there's improvement or if I did something wrong. Uh, I mean, can you help me with that? Oh, it, it, it depends on your virtual machine. And it's probably yeah, like by uh, like Azure or, uh, or Amazon, uh, on which you don't have low level potential access. Is it theoretically possible? Or? Because from some VMs uh, that uh, set up properly, they can get some bad data, but some are really. It's case dependent. Yeah, it's case dependent. So if you can contact us. Yeah, uh, sorry, I put the contact support. But I will get uh, this presentation before sending. I will put the contact support and you can write and ask. For your particular case, we have a chat support. Okay, okay. Yeah, this is me like this. You can ask directly. Very, very, very quick. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. How many times the new new features like uh, STD atomics and STD semaphores and the will it uh, help here also the compiler will it analyze it or is it not inside? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it's uh, not a source code level analyzer. I mean, so more deeper, depending on what you want us from atomic uh, point of view. I mean, is it efficient or not? Is that question? It's like that synchronization. The index is very slow compared to the PSA. The index is very slow compared to the STD. Oh, I think, I think we will show that information is measurement, but we are not uh, like... Uh, I don't need to define the source code, is it atomic or not, or is it static okay. and so on, but you will see the information is just trading result, how efficient it is it, and so on. Okay, so it will show. I think, yeah. So it's like just, just measurement. Yeah, just measurement. Just advise what to use uh, instead. I have a question on the user okay. So, for instance, the application will show now, if it's optimized for CPU, mm -hmm. and I have a new system mm -hmm. in it, like the possibility of GP, mm -hmm. can I run the advisor? And is it intelligent enough to tell me, hey, you have a GPU, and would you, it would be uh, advisable to offer these um, functions to this GPU? Uh, you, you depending on what you want, actually, uh, both uh, advice and return tools are working with GPUs uh, in a very efficient way, and they show you information about uh, you, uh, what is going on. You can profile your GPU application if you have already GPU application, then you can uh, uh, think, uh, see what uh, bottlenecks you have, but then also there will be recommendations for GPU what is going on and what you can uh, take to. You know, uh, yeah, so to deal with an issue, so also cache time techniques also present there are an issue and also you can uh, like an optimization, you can, you can see such advices and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, or if you have a CPU application and you want to port it to GPU, you also have a fault modeling feature. You can run it and see which what advisor suggests to port to GPU, then you can port it, rerun advisor with a GPU mode and see what it suggests then to uh, optimize if you have some bottlenecks. Both of them, yeah. Yeah, just a general comment. If you want suggestions how to modify the code, there are tools, and one of these is Kodi. Yeah, uh, this analyzes your loops and then tells you uh, what may be vectorizable and how to change the code. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of, I, I don't know how it's pronounced, it's SYCL, cycle, cycle, this, 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 uh, cycle. You know what I'm talking about? Cycle. Cycle. But with an S and S Y C L. Oh, it's cycle. It's a deficit yeah, plus pass actually. It is a deficit plus cycle. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how to do it. Uh, how, how did this play with this? Profiler, can you can you still profile this kind of thing and get some useful information? Yeah, yeah. Depending on the it doesn't uh, actually uh, depend on what you are. You, you can use a seeker for floating cost GPU or you, run, you can run it on CPU and also you can uh, profile it and see also see some advices for the particular secret application. Yeah, it's uh, uh, process. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Just uh, have a question regarding this tool. Can you catch the fault sharing for loops? Like yeah. In your example, that you modifying each modifying from the same block that can validate caching some the other code. Yeah, it's can. Both I think. Uh, maybe also Newton. Oh. Yeah, no problem. Like top-down methodology has such metric, and we have also a book beside. Yes, like, yeah, we would intend to see us. How to detect or share the problem, how to fix it. Yeah, both Vitune and Advisor can uh, do that actually. Uh, it's a uh, macro architecture for Vitune, Advisor, it's like a uh, uh, set of analysis, and you will see the recommendation for that. It is a cost sharing, some things on the ethical analysis. Yeah. One more question? Okay. okay. So, thanks for the talk. Um, all I've seen so far was mostly focused on like running something in the loop or like uh, like repeated work. Um, can I give can this analyzer give some advice or insights into like uh, code executions or like uh, let's imagine 
I'm not talking about like a cold file system cache, but like um, some generic piece of code, and maybe it gets called often, or maybe it doesn't get called often, and so it's just part of some bigger program. And then um, the instruction set size, or like an impact on an instruction cache, and other aspects, branch prediction, things that might be perfectly predicted in a hot loop during benchmarking, um, I will not show up in the same way if you just run it once or just occasionally in a part, as part of a bigger program. Is it, does it help in some way to analyze this kind of situation, or is it just mostly focused on like you run this hot loop and this, that's what we're analyzing? Yeah, that's a question. I need to think about that. Um, I feel, yeah, also better to have a, um, you, you are, the question is you are saying about do you want to find cold paths, like well, where does it happen, or what is? Because you still need to a measurable baseline and predictable one. If it's sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's cold, you will get a different result, but you will see that they are different. You will see some cache misses, for example, or some stuff like this. And the application will say, oh, okay, from this run, run, I have some. So this measure of information should be available. Yeah. So, but for the biggest application, better to uh, choose uh, some particular Think you want to run because the biggest application will be analyzed very uh, long time and will produce a lot of uh, data. And it's, uh, so, do I understand correctly? This works by doing statistical sampling of like hardware performance counters and whatnot, or like everything is possible. You can <laughs> annotate uh, part of your code mm -hmm. that you want to compile. You can use Intel uh, ITT and, okay. mm -hmm. and uh, you will uh, compile on the some part. So if you need to improve performance, everything, you will use everything is possible. It's just about a simple example, like when you have a good solid baseline, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can go fast through the steps, but if you need to improve performance, you, should, you will do everything. So, yeah. So it's a, it's applicable for a big uh, application with a or common code, not only for this particular sample. It's, it's a, it's a, but yeah, my advice was just uh, to not fail with a big big application because you know, it's, uh, it's data. so the marketing marketing people will love that if it is possible. <laughs> okay, let's keep it at that. Thank you for the talk.